welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course on troubleshooting security systems. I'm James Messer and I'll be your host through this module where we're going to discuss the requirements from our 220-601 and 220-602 exams, section 6.3, where we need to diagnose and troubleshoot hardware, software, and data security issues. We're going to build on a number of concepts from some of our previous modules on security, but we're going to di dive into problems that we can run into with our BIOS, with our programs that protect us from malicious software. We'll look at smart cards and authentication technologies and how we can troubleshoot problems with those. We'll look at software firewall issues, data access and permissions, backup data migration, wireless client configurations, and finally, encryption technology issues. Let's begin our conversation of troubleshooting these security issues, dealing with BIOS security. Whenever you have a BIOS that has a very secure configuration, you may have assigned passwords into it. There's also a way to assign boot device configurations and also to enable and disable ports. But problems can come from that. If you forget your supervisor password, for instance, you may have an issue. And so whenever you're configuring these pieces, this is on an individual workstation basis. And remember, if you ever need to to change this, there's really no way to remotely desktop into these machines to see what's going on. You have to go to the device to configure these. So if you are setting up a security, think about what you're going to do when you run into problems. Because this is the BIOS, and if you have an issue with forgetting passwords, not having the right access, not being able to configure ports on this device because you've locked it down, you're going to need to know how to reset that BIOS. On older BIOS systems, it was easy. You could pull a battery out of your system or change a jumper, and it would reconfigure your BIOS. Newer BIOS configurations aren't quite so simple. This may not be quite as easy as that. So check with the BIOS manufacturer or the manufacturer of that particular personal computer and find out how do you get around this problem if you run into errors. These days, we have loaded up our workstations with software that's going to protect us, protect us from other pieces of software that are trying to do bad things to our systems, antivirus systems, spyware. We want to be sure that the applications on our systems are up to date. And what we want to be sure of is that all of those packages and systems that we've got on our, on our computer to protect us are working properly. Unfortunately, occasionally, you may see a false positive from this. That means that an antivirus software may report to you that it has found a virus. But in reality, it hasn't. It's found something that looks like a virus. But unfortunately, all antivirus software has some level of false positives associated with it. The idea behind this, of course, is that it's protecting you. And it is better to be safe than sorry. But keep in mind that if you receive an alert, don't go uh, off the handle quite yet. You want to confirm that it, yes, indeed, was a virus that was stopped. And fortunately, there will be logs available that you or the administrator of your antivirus system can go back in time and look at and then examine the files that you're pulling down. If this is a file that you need access to and your antivirus software is protecting you from that file unnecessarily, you may be able to say, no, that's really a good file. You can right click the file and say, this one's all right. You can let me use that one on your system. But you want to be very certain about that. There's always going to be signature updates for these. So a signature update for your antivirus, for your spyware. There may be updates for software running, application software running on your system. So you want to be sure that your signature update process is turned on and that perhaps it even does this automatically. You can configure these packages these days to wait until your system goes idle or wait until very early in the morning. And it goes out and grabs the latest set of signatures from these. These signatures are updated very, very often, at least once a week and very often and very much more than that. If you're even a week behind, your system is wide open for attack by many different kinds of antivirus and spyware. So make sure you maintain those signature updates. We talked in an earlier video about multi-factor authentication and having multiple ways to get into a system, multiple requirements that someone would need, a username, a password, and then perhaps something they have, like a smart card or a token generator. Well, that works great until you lose the token generator or until the battery in the token generator goes bad and you can no longer get numbers out of it. Or what if you lose your smart card? What do you do then? The idea behind with these hardware problems is there needs to be a process in place to either get you a new smart card or to get you a token generator that's working. So you have to think about that when you start assigning these or creating policies to use these things. What do you do when something goes wrong? And most of the time, the manufacturers of these devices have a process that 
they have in place that can help you along that. Maybe it's a temporary access. You can give somebody a temporary set of numbers that they can use that's not coming from a smart card or from your token generator. It's on a sheet of paper, and it allows you maybe to log in 10 times. And that would get you at least through the, the connections and the connectivity you would need until you got a new token generator in the mail. You can also have problems with biometrics. Although your fingerprint probably isn't going to go bad, the hardware that reads your fingerprint very well may. This is, after all, a piece of hardware. It does have the potential to have problems associated with it. But there are also a set of software drivers that come along with that as well. Generally, once it's set up, you should be OK. But if there are changes to your operating system, if a new set of patches comes through, there is a potential that this biometric piece of hardware may start having problems. So you want to be sure that if you're having problems, you go through the normal process of troubleshooting your hardware, having a look at your device manager, and troubleshooting your software to make sure that the problem isn't somewhere else in your system. Personal firewalls and local software-based firewalls are now integrated into our operating systems. But there can be situations when you're using a piece of software where the application just won't work. The way these application firewalls and these software-based firewalls are designed to work is that they'll notice an application talking out. And what that does is open a small hole that allows the application response to come back in. The challenges you're going to have is if the application you're running is one that sits and waits for someone else to connect to it, well, a hole was never made in your firewall for other devices to come in and talk to you. So it may be required for you to go into your firewall and make a change to the configuration that opens up a hole big enough for this application to be able to use. You will usually see this happen once you've installed the application for the first time. If the application is working after installation, then you're going to be OK. You probably don't have to do anything to get the firewall working. But if it's not working, make sure you check your manufacturer, your application manual, to see if there is something you need to turn on. Almost all application manuals that use the network these days will have a section in there about the firewall. And they'll talk about how you configure the application. You turn on these particular configurations. You set up your firewall so that if it sees this application running, it opens up this connection into that application and only that application. What you don't want to end up doing is opening up entire ports into your system that are just open all the time. That's something you really would only do at a very last case scenario. If you're opening entire ports, you should probably be suspicious of this configuration because it's going to create a security risk for you, which means even if this application isn't running, the port remains open. And that's something that's not very good from a security perspective. So if you can tighten down the configuration of the firewall, you're going to be in much better shape from a security perspective. This is the Exceptions tab of My Windows Firewall. If you go into your Control Panel, there's an option in there for Windows Firewall. And the Windows Firewall Exceptions, you'll notice, have a list of programs and services that are exceptions for the firewall. Now, my firewall right now is turned off. I have a third-party firewall being used here. But on your Windows XP system, you may be using this Windows Firewall. If you want to add a program so that you can set up an exception for a certain program, notice there's a list of programs in there already. But you could certainly browse for a program to be able to do that. Here's the thing I don't necessarily want you to do, which is adding a port yourself, which says your application x can use port number 222, for instance, over TCP. But notice it even tells you what are the risks of opening a port. There are risks associated with this. So you need to be aware of that. If your application says the only way it's going to work is doing this, then you may want to have some other security pieces in mind to be able to protect this machine from anybody else or anything else using this port to get in at your system. In a previous module, we talked about converting your file system from a FAT or a FAT32 into an NTFS file system. And the reason we did that was really from a security perspective. And when we say that NTFS, from a security perspective, is better than FAT32, we mean it is so much better than FAT32, especially from a security perspective. There are so many different permissions and changes into security with NTFS that you really should consider this if you're still running a FAT or FAT32 configuration. You should at least understand the fundamentals of NTFS permissions and configurations. But one of the things you'll notice is that you now have many more options available. So you can make very granular security policies and settings for the permissions into the resources on your system. And if multiple people are going to be accessing your system and you're going to want to protect your file system, then you're really going to want to consider making sure you're running with NTFS.
To give you a feel for what some of these permissions are, I've opened up my local disk properties, and you can see here are their permission settings I can do just on this drive itself. I have full control. I can have modify, read and execute, list the folder contents, simply read, simply write, and of course, set up special permissions for individual users. And if I click my advanced button, you can see in here, I can set up very, very specific permissions for different configurations. My administrators, for instance, look at all of the different permission entries that are available to me. And the reason I have these entire set here is that I'm running NTFS. If this was a FAT or a FAT32 desktop, this file system on my hard drive, I would not have the ability to set this level of granular control of these permissions. So when we talk about moving into an NTFS environment, there are certainly advantage at the operating system level, but also think about some of these advantages that you would have from a security level. If you're performing a backup or a migration of data, some very good best practices to keep in mind, especially from a troubleshooting and a control perspective, is to make sure that your backup media is secure and your migration media is secure. If you're migrating someone's machine from one system to another, you still have all of that user's data on the old computer. You shouldn't just take that computer and then give it to someone else because it still has all of that data on there. You want to either remove it or make sure that you've replaced the drive inside that system so that nobody else will have access to it. Similar scenario for backup media. If you've backed up a system, everything on that backup media is a duplication. So you want to be sure you keep control of that as well. Many people are backing up across the network, and they're integrating encryption into that across the network backup these days. So you'll notice some of the newer technologies available for backup are not only going to send that data and back it up and make a copy of it in case something should happen, but as it's transferring the data, it's going to protect it across the network so that nobody else could eavesdrop in and see all of your data going by. We've said multiple times in this video series that we want to be sure our wireless network is secure. The way to do that is to encrypt the data. One nice thing about troubleshooting this and making sure it works is that it's either going to work because we've configured it properly or it just doesn't. You really don't have a lot of in-betweens with configuring a wireless link. You need to make sure that your client matches the encryption technologies that are being used on your access point. And that's either going to be a WEP, it's going to be a WPA or a WPA2. If you need more updates on what that exactly is, you can go back to our video that talks about wireless network security, and we break some of those things down for you. The other piece you want to be sure of is once you've decided on the type of encryption technology there is, make sure that the shared key matches. The shared key is the key that has been given to you by the administrator that has to match on both sides. That's the one thing that is shared. So make sure you've written down things that the upper cases and lower cases are correct, that you haven't mistaken a number for a letter. And that way, you'll be sure that when you turn this on and you connect your wireless network, that it's going to be able to communicate properly. If any of those things doesn't match up, then you'll be in trouble. The Windows configuration for a wireless network, you can see the network authentication piece is very well listed here. You may have a separate client for your wireless card. If you're running an Intel card, Intel has their own client. But you configure things in a very similar way. You would either configure WPA or WPA2, for instance. You may also want to configure the data encryption type of that network authentication that you're setting up. And there'll be options underneath this as well. All of these, of course, have to match what's on your access point. So if you don't know what's configured there, get in touch with the person administering that access point, and they'll let you know what that is. There's also options to be able to enable additional authentication into the network automatically so that it not only will encrypt the data, but it also needs to confirm that you are allowed to be on this network. And that's usually done through whatever system you have in your environment to be able to log into your workstation. You don't see this a lot in home offices, but in larger offices, you'll certainly see this where multiple people need access. So they may use something like a protected EAP, a smart card, or even other methods to be able to authenticate a user name and password onto that access point. And that means they can turn on and off your access from a central place, makes it easy to administer that access point. We've talked a lot about encrypting data in this video series, and it's something that you should absolutely consider if you want to protect your data. But one thing to keep in mind, if you're ever in a position where you need to troubleshoot or get access into encrypted data, is you're going to have to have that key. You're going to need that passphrase or that password that allows you access into that encrypted data. 
If you lose your passphrase or you can't remember that passphrase into that encrypted data, more often than not, you just don't have access to it any longer. All of the data that you stored away that is encrypted is no longer available to you. That's the whole idea, after all, of encrypting that data is you're trying to protect it so that nobody can get around your encryption technologies. Nobody has a backdoor that would let them in through some other method. Once you forget it, you're out of luck. You may be sorry that you ever forgot that passphrase. So it's very important you keep that in mind. From a virtual private network configuration, usually you want to be sure that the con configurations on both sides of the tunnel are exactly the same. When you're configuring your VPN client on your workstation, you're going to get an IP address or the name of a remote server. You're also going to get some username information. So you want to make sure you have the right information on your client and that your client is configured exactly the way it is on the other side. If there are changes that are made to the VPN concentrator or the endpoint that you're connecting to, you're going to want to make sure those changes are also saved under the configuration that you have on your local client. Remember that you also have file encryption built into the operating system on NTFS. So you have the ability right in the operating system to right mouse click on a file and begin some type of security and encryption of that information. Again, you want to be sure you keep that password. If you lose that password, then you are no longer going to have access to that information. And if your administrator wants to get into your system and changes some of the password and information for you, it's possible you may not be able to go back and get access to that encrypted data. So it's something you don't do lightly. But if you need this capability, just keep in mind that if you ever want to get back to that data, you're going to need to remember those passphrases. In review, we've looked at troubleshooting a lot of different security technologies from our BIOS and our smart cards through our malicious software protection and our software-based firewalls. We've also dis discussed the importance of troubleshooting our data access and permissions, our backup and data migration strategies, and protecting our wireless networks with our client configurations. Finally, we discussed some of the challenges behind encryption and why it's so important to remember those passphrases. For more free a videos, to participate in our message boards, or much more, you can visit our website, freeaplus.com.